I never set out to win a Nobel Prize. I only set out to do everything to the best of my ability, and I never put in a second-rate effort. With such resilience in his work, Sir Haro Kroto finally became the co-winner of the 1996 Nobel Prize for Chemistry. This professor from Florida State University was awarded the Nobel Prize for his discovery of the carbon compounds called fullerenes. This discovery opened up an entirely new branch of chemistry with consequences in such diverse areas as astrochemistry, superconductivity, and materials chemistry physics. Professor Sohara Kroto presently carries out research in nanoscience and nanotechnology and has served as president of the Royal Society of Chemistry. He has also set up the Vega Science Trust, a UK educational charity and TV science channel accessed by over 165 countries, of which many programs have been broadcast on BBC aiming to improve knowledge and raise awareness of scientific achievements. Hello and welcome to this special edition of Talk Vietnam for an exclusive interview with 1996 Nobel Laureate in Chemistry, Professor Sir Harold Croto from Florida State University. It's our great honor and privilege to have him here with us. Today, we'll learn more about the discovery that won him the Nobel Prize and his unique philosophy of science. Professor Sir Harold Croto, nice to meet you. Hi. Thank you so much for being here with us. Oh, did I have a choice? <laughs> well, how are you today? Well, I'm still alive, <laughs> more or less, um, but uh, interesting, and uh, my first visit to Vietnam, mm -hmm. and uh, so far it's been very interesting and uh, enjoyable. That's great. What was your first impression upon arrival? Well, I haven't had a long, uh, lot, uh, <laughs> but uh, I mean, one th first impression is that there's quite a lot of building going on, mm -hmm. and, uh, so, and also that uh, a lot of the houses that I saw were well constructed. And, uh, <laughs> They, uh, uh, in, in, a, in a way that many uh, buildings in the USA, they're made of wood and will fall yeah. down in a, in a hurricane. But uh, I, I've not been really here long enough to form an impression. Uh, I only know of Vietnam from outside and, yeah. uh, and uh, from films and things of this nature. Um, but uh, I have a good impression of Vietnam, partly because I see something deep in the culture that has allowed it to uh, make friends with America mm -hmm. uh, after the difficulties uh, of about 50 years ago. Yeah. And I think um, Vietnam has a, uh, can, uh, is a lesson to other countries in the world um, on how they can overcome the, those sorts of difficulties. Um, mm -hmm. And so I. I've always felt there's something special about the country that mm -hmm. can do that. And what made you decide to donate your valuable time and energy to the fourth ASEAN event series, Bridges Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace? Uh, well, I think I've been, in, uh, I, I'm invited somewhere every day, and that was one that interested me, but it took a long time mm -hmm. to come and to, uh, to be able to come because I have a long backlog of, um, of requests. Um, but, I mean, peace is obviously something that interests me. Uh, my view is that I'm going around the world and talking to young people um, and trying, trying to inspire them to do science and think about uh, thinking for themselves, but also uh, developing a humanitarian attitude. And hopefully, if they get into positions of responsibility, change the direction of po politicians uh, towards working together to solve their problems rather than sending young people to go and mm -hmm. kill each other. Yeah. And um, how about your schoolboy times? You were still a schoolboy when you developed what you call an unhealthy interest in chemistry. <laughs> um, yeah, that's you... a, a bit of a joke, but yes, um, um, yeah, I, but when I was, a, was young, I, I was good at making things with mm -hmm. my hands. Um, and my father, who was a refugee, really um, tr uh, ensured that I had things to, to make. And you mentioned your father. So did your parents have a great influence on facilitating your interest in natural science? Well, my father was an en engineer, mm -hmm. and um, he did influence me because he um, he gave me an electric train set, and I had Meccano and things. He, he certainly, certainly, these were things that were given to me. And I also had a big room 
It was an old house. Mm -hmm. It was really in the slums, but I had my own world in there where I had a train set and made things out of a, a set called Meccano mm -hmm. and things of this nature. So he definitely encouraged the practical side of things and um, less so on the art side because that, but I think, I even seem today think I'm better at that, <laughs> although I've had much less practice at it than I, I, I really would have liked to have done more of that than I've been able to do. Were you the best in your class as no, a student? No, not at all. Um, I, um, I, I was good, but I was never the best in the class. And it depends what subject. So I was, uh, I was up in the top quarter or third mm -hmm. in general. Um, the only thing I was best at as a young child was geography. I mean, I, oh. I, that, was, that was the subject. And I, 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 I remember coming top in geography and deciding, oh, I can be top in something. So <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll focus on geography. And I think yeah. that's uh, it, part of it. But um, I, didn't, I don't like competition. I don't mm. think it's healthy. I think the thing top of the form is not a good thing because there are kids at the bottom. Uh, we've got to... We've got to have a totally different attitude to schoolwork. We somehow have to encourage people, the young kid who's, who's you know, bottom of the form. What sort mm -hmm. of incentive is that? Yeah. So there's something at really at a very fundamental level not right in the way that we imprint competition yeah. as being good in our, school, in our schools and education programs. I don't know what the solution is, but that's definitely not one yeah. of them. <laughs> because every kid has some potential, and uh, I think a lot of them, when they're bottom of the form, then feel that's it and uh, they can't achieve anything. As, and uh, we need to think, rethink yeah. that. Definitely. And what advice would you give to a child who would want to be where you are now? Well, don't even think about it. <laughs> I mean, I, uh, I've, I've said that I'm... I'm a Nobel Prize winner and I never thought of this and if people had said uh, you're going to be a Nobel Prize winner I, I would have said you're, you're crazy. Uh, I didn't go into science to win any prizes. Mm. I didn't even go into it to be a professor. I, the advice I have to all children, whatever it is, it's not about science, mm -hmm. is, is to find something which uh, satisfies them Mm -hmm. so, um, I'm, I don't like the word enjoyment. You say, I, I enjoy this. I don't enjoy hard work any more than anybody else's. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I think um, people who are successful in being creative um, get something else. It's a, they enjoy when they're finished, but they're able to f somehow just immerse themselves in a creative process where hard work doesn't seem hard work. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's something that the hard work pays off by some, achieving something at the end, uh, and they get they're satisfied that they've done something that nobody else mm -hmm. could do. Um, but they, it's also something that is determination. And I tell young people, if you're doing something and second rate after uh, a second rate job satisfy you, find something else where only a first-rate eff effort, mm -hmm. your best shot will satisfy you, and uh, then you'll be successful. Sir Harry Croteau was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1996 with Robert Curl and Richard Smalley for the discovery of C60, the molecule made up of 60 carbon atoms that garnered fame for being shaped like a soccer ball. C60 was named Buckminster Fullerene, or Buckyballs, in tribute to the architect Buckminster Fuller and his iconic geodesic domes. The discovery of Buckyballs led to an entirely new branch of chemistry, the science of fullerenes. Until then, carbon was only known to take on two forms. One was extremely hard, diamond, and the other very soft, but electrically conductive, graphite. The new fullerene molecules and their close relations, carbon nanotubes, often exhibit both of these properties and are already being tested in solar cells, nanocircuits, and drug delivery systems. Carbon nanotubes have already proven to be the strongest materials in the world and promise exceptionally light and versatile components. I have a, a mission 
to ensure that you, people understand science. Science is about asking questions and curiosity. So how about your Nobel Prize? <coughs> What triggered your discovery of C60 in 1985? Well, I was interested in um, the chemistry in a star. Mm -hmm. But I've done 20 years of research to get mm -hmm. to that. And uh, uh, we'd done some work in the laboratory with a colleague, David mm -hmm. Walton, which ended up at a nice piece of research, which ended up with the discovery of molecules in uh, interstellar space by radio astronomy. And then other people discovered an interesting star which had some interesting chemistry. And I was interested in that. And just by really pure chance, I was visiting Rice University to, with a friend of mine, a scientist, Bob Curl, who said I should go and visit uh, Rick Smalley in another lab. He's doing something interesting. And it looked interesting. And then I went to see him. And during this, um, that visit for an hour, I could see that this technology that Rick had created <coughs> really was revolutionary as far as cluster science was concerned, might actually just solve a little problem that had been in the back of my mind, not very important, interesting to me, not really interesting to mm -hmm. anybody else. Um, and then we did it and it worked exactly as I expected, except that it had an incredible surprise that it did something else. Mm -hmm. it, it, the result was, I mean, I didn't even need to do it. I mean, it seemed <laughs> to me it was obvious it was going to give this result. But it did something else totally unexpected, and that led to the Nobel Prize. And um, there's a lesson here that uh, here was an experiment that wasn't particularly important to my colleagues. It was more important to me personally, but not on an mm -hmm. outside level. just wanted to solve a little problem in my head, and mm -hmm. here was an incredible breakthrough which was totally unexpected and that's the way that many breakthroughs are made it's not going after these important things it's not competing with other people if you're competing with other people a hundred other groups who think this is important then you've only got a one percent chance of making the breakthrough yeah. so do what you're interested in doing don't worry about others of course you've got to convince people to give you the money to do <laughs> it well work hard on that and then piggyback your real interest <laughs> on top of this thing. And uh, you also once said that science is misunderstood in many ways. Yeah. Can you elaborate on that, please? Well, the first th that uh, young people and the iconic image of a scientist is really Einstein. There's an old mm -hmm. guy with yeah. long hair when in fact he was, and um, he was a young man with very short hair <laughs> when he made the big breakthroughs. So that's the first misunderstanding of who, who the scientists are. Mm. The second part is, is much more serious one, and, and that is that science is not understood by anyone, particularly mm -hmm. people who are journalists. And that is the only, nine out of 10 times when a journalist comes to ask me about it, they ask what are the applications of your discovery? Now, that's because the only thing understood is not the science itself mm -hmm. or what the discovery was, but how it can apply to society. But that's not the way that much science works. The third thing, arguably more important, is how does a, a scientist discover something that's unknown beforehand, the scientific method? Mm -hmm. And how, do, how is that done? And that's the scientist. But I think there's something much more important than that at a very deep intellectual, cultural, and mm -hmm. educational level. And that is to recognize that science is really quite new. Mm -hmm. It really only goes back about 500 years. Before that, it was common sense. Um, and common sense is what you need to survive. But before it was called science, it was called natural philosophy. And the point that I make is natural philosophy is the only construct we have to determine what is true. Mm -hmm. with any degree of reliability. And I think we should teach that to young people in school. And we should teach them to question and ask people, ask their teachers, just a minute, you're telling me this. Uh, how do you know yeah. it's true? What is the evidence for what you're telling me? 
And if, it, if they can't find evidence, then it's not tr necessarily true. Upon his arrival in Hanoi, Professor Croto has joined a press briefing at Hilton Hanoi Opera. Let's take a look. As part of the fourth ASEAN Bridges Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace series, Nobel laureate Professor Harold Croto was invited to be a speaker during his stay in Hanoi. Known for one of the most important contributions to the development of nanoscience, Professor Croto hoped to have some impact on Vietnam's education sector. We have invited Professor Groto because he's speaking about education as a basis for peace, which is the main theme of the International Peace Foundation. Because we are supporting universities with connecting them with Nobel laureates. Uh, we are supporting education and schools because we think that this is the real basis for peace in the, in the future. Professor Croto isn't only focused on science. He also has made a lot of efforts to help boost education and science around the world. Answering questions from Vietnamese journalists during the visit, he emphasized the importance of education, saying that it is good for the development of Vietnam in the future. Your educational system must cater across the spectrum from those who have, in the sciences uh, are good at solving clear, important problems to others who um, are good at solving their own problems that no one else has thought of and then where surprising breakthroughs are made which will be useful for Vietnam. During this visit, Professor Croto met Deputy Prime Minister Nguyen Thiện Nhân and students at the Vietnam National University Hanoi. This is the first visit of a Nobel laureate in chemistry to Vietnam. So, how has the Nobel Prize changed your life? Well, the first thing is that I gave a lot of lectures before, mm -hmm. but now I give a, a lot more lectures. <laughs> and it's an interesting uh -huh. question. So it has um, meant that I'm on the road. My wife is on the road. We're both mm -hmm. on the road probably one third of the year. Oh, wow. And uh, we were in 127 hotel rooms, wow. 127 days in a hotel last year. And I feel a responsibility to, particularly to talk to students wherever I go. Looking back at your career path so far, have you ever felt that it was tough to get through? Was, what was the biggest challenge that you had to overcome? Oh, it was very hard. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I mean, personally it was very hard, but uh, got a lot of support family-wise, mm -hmm. um, really a burden of taking off. And I think probably not very good because I worked too much, and certainly at the start, uh, over much. And I think uh, to some extent, um, you know, that took the toll on the family a lot more. Um, but it, it, it um, I think science is not easy. Mm. And um, uh, it was a hundred percent. I mean, not later on, but certainly at the start uh, to get research going. Um, I didn't know how. I think if I'd known how hard it was, I would have done something else. I've often said it's like going in the ring with Muhammad Ali. <laughs> uh, and on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you get knocked out in the first round. You pick yourself up on Friday. Maybe you get to the second round. Once a month, you get to the third or fourth round. Once a year, you get to the tenth round. And if you're incredibly lucky and he sort of has an off day, uh, you, you might sneak around and knock him on the nose and, <laughs> and you get the Nobel Prize. And, and that's hard to take. And you have to have a certain internal resilience, mm -hmm. which most scientists actually have. And not everybody has. And, um, and no, not everybody has the supportive family mm -hmm. around them that I had. You made a summer 2012 uh, presentation at the 62nd Lindau Nobel Laureate meeting in Germany. And this annual meeting brings together Nobel laureates and young researchers for integrational inspiration. Yes. Um, a key line in your Lindau presentation was, I'm not here to make you feel comfortable. I'm here to make you think. Yes. And uh, so can you tell me a little bit about that experience in Lindau? Well, I mean, I've been to Lindau many times, mm -hmm. and I, as time has gone on, I, I, underneath that has always been um, 
to get people to think because I think it's very important that they don't accept what other people tell them. Um, and uh, I also said, I, I, this is uh, a quotation which I like very much, if you make people think they're thinking, mm -hmm. they love you. But if you really make them think, they hate you. <laughs> and this is by a, a journalist, Don Marquis, in the 1930s. I think that uh, the young people who go to Lindell, many of them will be going to positions of responsibility and they should do, they will become leaders. And for me, leadership is about uh, leading young people to think for themselves so that they no longer need to be led. So we know you're committed to global science ed education and the development of internet streaming technologies. Yes. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your success in the field? Well, I, I'm not sure it's successful. I think it's <laughs> successful, but uh, um, I started off um, over 15 years ago um, making mm -hmm. programs for television, mm -hmm. BBC television, because they had an open access slot. And in those days, the technology was very expensive, and it was, it was quite expensive, and I had to pull in a lot of money to do this. And over 15, 16 years, I think we were very successful. But also, the Internet became very powerful. And I recognize one of the greatest breakthroughs in education um, was Wikipedia. However, it seems to me it's objective. What we're trying to do is going to the next step from Wikipedia and subjectivity. I want to see the person who created a particular idea. I like to see young people trying to teach. Not, and they don't even need to have a lot of experience. They, I just want to see their enthusiasm for, their, for that. We're distributing um, an idea so that schools, universities, individual teachers can contribute mm -hmm. this. Uh, recording themselves, uh, explaining particular concepts that they've developed. Everybody sees something in a different way. They, we're looking at the same object, the same idea, the same story and they interpret it in different ways. Mm -hmm. And I think life is about that. It, life is about human beings. And so uh, I want to put subjectivity into Wikipedia. Yeah. And we're doing that not just with teachers, not just with professors, not just with Nobel Prize winners, but with young kids of six, mm -hmm. seven, ten years old. And they all come with their own little ideas with this. And perhaps they're a bit half-baked, but that's great yeah. because they are now creating. Mm -hmm because education is not just about um, teaching kids what is known, but it's actually uh, uncapping their creative potential uh, as much as possible. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to do. During his stay in Vietnam this time, Professor Croto, Chemistry Nobel Laureate, visited the Vietnam National University, where he gave a talk on education, the basis of peace, and the key to an enlightened global community. Let's take a closer look. Professor Koro's arrival marked the second time that Vietnam National University Hanoi had the honor to be visited by a Nobel laureate since last December. Before giving his lecture, Professor Croto was presented the honorary doctorate by the university leaders. This was considered a milestone in the strategy to improve science education and development in the education sector. Hiện nay là chúng tôi đang chọn khoa hóa học để xây dựng cái khóa đầu tiên trong đại học quốc gia nội đạt chuẩn quốc tế thì rất may lần này thì chúng tôi được đón một cái nhà khoa học được giải thưởng Nobel về khoa học chúng tôi thấy rằng qua cái dịp này thì cái những cái hoài bão những cái đam mê khoa học của sinh viên khoa học của trường đại học khoa tự nhiên đại học quốc gia Hà nội sẽ được tăng lên rất nhiều. Instead of spending time to explain how his research won him a Nobel Prize. Professor Quoto told students stories of his life, his other passions such as graphic design and sport, and his experiences in choosing a career. He said that being passionate about the things you like can only lead to good results. That's one of the key pieces of advice Professor Quoto gave to the Vietnamese students. I would have been quite happy not winning the Nobel Prize, okay? I was, I was very happy with my science before we made the discovery. I felt I was a success. 
I didn't go into science to win any prizes, let alone the Nobel Prize. And that's very important because I see here in Asia, how do you win a Nobel Prize? I don't know. I just do what I'm interested in. If it turns out something special comes, then maybe the Nobel Prize will come. Nguyen Kheng Hung is among the chemistry faculty's many students that listen to Professor Kroto. Seeing a big name in chemistry in person sparked a passion for science among Hung and his peers. Khi biết được là quá trình phấn đấu của ngài thì em càng thấy rằng là mình càng phải cố gắng hơn nữa và cũng như là một niềm sức mạnh để truyền cho em và cảm thấy được rằng là mình phải cố gắng hơn nữa để có thể biết đâu sau đấy là sẽ là sinh viên Việt Nam thì hoàn toàn có thể đạt một giải Nobel nào đó trong tương lai. It could well be a long time before Professor Proto has another chance to meet Vietnamese students again. But his words will remain in the mind of these young people, acting as guidelines and driving force for their decisions in the future. So there it is. I'm only here to make you think. Thank you very much. In your lecture here in Vietnam, um, when you spoke at the National University, um, you spoke about education, the basis for peace, and the key to an enlightened global community. Yeah. So can you please brief us about the highlights of your presentation with some examples to illustrate? Um, well, the, the first thing is uh, education should be, as I say, first of all, teaching kids how they can decide what they're being told is true. The second thing is, and actually more important, is to develop a humanitarian attitude to mm -hmm to the way things are, so that if they become scientists, they don't make more atomic bombs and landmines and things like this. Um, but from a teaching point, they have to be creative. And I think to be creative, you have to have a wide uh, education, not just in science. Whereas in the 50s, and when we were using it, we had to have rational attitude to fixing things. Some car didn't work that well, so you had to work out you have to have a scientific attitude to working out mm -hmm. what you fix. And so the dynamics of the technology now, I think, are counterproductive mm -hmm. as far as our young people are concerned. So that's a problem. And, and also the influences on them are not to do science and do things that are difficult and complicated. Yeah. They see, you know, supermodels making a huge amount of money and celebrities making this, that, and the other. Mm -hmm. And so there's less incentive to work hard and mm -hmm. learn differential equations, which are not easy. So um, I point to those issues, yeah. or try to point to some of those thousands of issues uh, in my presentation. Mm -hmm. And after your first visit to the Vietnam National University, um, have you thought of any particular plans for cooperation or assistance? Yes, I mean, the, perhaps the most important reason for my travel is I, I try to get schools and universities to cooperate with me and participate in this global educational mm -hmm. outreach yeah. program for science, engineering, and technology, which is GeoSat, so that we, they will contribute mm -hmm. and um, that uh, we'll get young people, particularly students in universities, to contribute their ideas and what they find mm -hmm. fascinating to this global cache of educational material. So what do you think is perhaps the biggest challenge facing many young scientists today? Well, I did talk about these. Uh, the first is to be a scientist at all. Mm -hmm. um, 
because uh, it's not a real understanding of what it is. I think some of them want to win Nobel Prizes and they won't win them. They've got to do science because, first of all, they can make a good living at it, which is useful, uh, but also that they, they can play around with the way the universe is and be curious at wh where it is and work hard to find out how, how it works, why it works the way it does. Um, the second thing, it's actually quite difficult because I think the world today is so highly technological that young people, when they have a mobile phone or whatever, they can't find out how it works, whereas all the things that were around me when I was a kid, I could take them apart uh, and see how they worked. I might not be able to put them back together again, but I could <laughs> see how it worked. I mean, I could take a clock to pieces and, oh, there's a spring, and I, yeah, I could see yeah. roughly how it worked. I couldn't put it back together again. <laughs> and so my world was full of things that I could um, repair. Mm -hmm. And you learn how things work by repairing them. You can't repair them now. You can't repair a camera. I mean, I had a camera, and I knew everything about that camera. And it, it works today as well as it work then if I had the film to put in it. And I could, I could probably make some film, right? Mm -hmm. But if my present camera goes, with all that electronics goes, um, then that's more or less it, mm -hmm. because it'll be more expensive to fix it than to buy the next and generation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably bad for the um, development of a scientific attitude mm -hmm. and I think we need to be aware of that but there are also other problems for kids today I didn't there were no people earning hundreds of thousands of pounds to play soccer when I was uh, uh, sort of starting soccer players in England got 20 pounds a week uh -oh. right I could make t more than 20 pounds a week I think doing science. But I certainly can't make a hundred thousand pound a week uh, doing science, whereas some soccer players are being paid that yeah. and they're injured, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that's not good. So we have this celebrity issue. So um, that, uh, you know, footballers are being paid these huge amounts of money and therefore that's a bad icon for young people, particularly the, the African-American community in the USA where most of the uh, icons they have are uh, foot, American footballers, basketball players, mm -hmm. and, and how many can, can be successful uh, professionally in this? Uh, not very many. And I look, look at um, Central Africa. Um, what are their icons? They're marathon runners. Well, how many are going to be able to earn a living yeah. as a marathon runner? So I think it's very important that in the developing world, we ha they start to have icons, scientific icons, and I think it's fantastic that you have a Fields Medalist here in Vietnam to mm -hmm. show that um, you know intellectual hard work and uh, a passion to understand something in the math, mathematics and sciences no, I'll tell you. is, is mm -hmm. possible. But I'm sure he didn't do this to win a lot of money mm -hmm. or even probably to win the Fields Medal yeah. um, because it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, nine out of ten Nobel Prize winners, I am sure, are totally s as surprised as I am that we won the Nobel Prize. There are one or two who tackle big problems and I know them and I just say well I don't tackle big <laughs> problems they're too difficult for me <laughs> and it turns out that as I said before the unexpected is where the big surprise during is. the reception held in your honor Vietnamese Deputy Prime Minister Nguyen Thien Nhan said that Vietnam looks forward to your support in the future do you plan to return to Vietnam for any cooperation projects um, or to help Vietnamese scientists in some yes, way? Yes, I, I, I intend to return by internet at the very least <laughs> uh, because I now can't go everywhere. Yeah. <coughs> so um, I now give presentations via the internet and I do this maybe uh, several times mm -hmm. a year to India. And I've done this now to Iceland, to Germany, to in Australia, to 2,000 kids, so I can mm -hmm. reach people that I can't go any other way. Um, but I, I'm hoping that um, 
it'd be a two-way thing that uh, there will be creation of educational material in, uh, in Vietnamese mm -hmm. here yeah. and contribution to this uh, global initiative. Mm -hmm. In a developing country like Vietnam, how do you think we should invest in science, including chemistry? What strategies or approaches should Vietnam consider for the future? Well, not to think about uh, com competition, but to create a, an environment in your universities where young people, young scientists can do what they want to do rather than what people in authority think they should be doing. Mm -hmm. Because you can't be creative doing something yeah. you're not passionate about. And if you look at um, the, the big breakthrough, almost all the big scientific breakthroughs have been done by individuals uh, not doing strategic mm -hmm. science, but uh, they're doing fundamental science of things that they're interested in. So um, can you ter tell me, in terms of chemistry and your Nobel Prize, what do you think brought you to the success? Um, that I never did anything um, other than something that I was determined to do the mm -hmm. best I possibly could. I've, I've always told young people, if, they do, if they're doing something, or doing a project where second-rate efforts satisfy them, find something else to do. So I don't do things. Um, I, all I do, I do to the best of my ability. So I played the guitar at university. To the, I wasn't that good, but it was the best I could mm -hmm. do. And I wanted to do it. And so I, 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 for a year, I really mm -hmm. worked at it. And I was OK. I could play in a folk club. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I haven't got the time for that. I do my science. I go in, and it's the best I can do. I'm not going to do something where second-rate effort mm -hmm. will satisfy me. So that, that's the first thing. And then I don't give up very easily. So there are, I'm working on a problem now, which is 25 years. Wow. Uh, um, it's not that I've been doing, working on it for mm -hmm. 25 years. It's something that puzzled me 25 years ago when we discovered this molecule, the fullerenes. And I didn't understand how, how it assembled. So what role does your family play in, in your scientific family. success story? Yeah. Um, my, my wife a lot because she took an immense burden off my shoulders. Because if you're mm -hmm. an academic, you have to teach, you have to do research. Basically, it was a tremendous burden on, on my wife and also, I think, on my kids. Uh, because um, to some extent, I assumed they were going to be like me <laughs> and work really hard and uh, they would be, um, but they chose careers which one wants to be a film, is a film director, another one in cartoonists, and they're very hard to make a living there. And uh, that's what they do, but it's, uh, it's tough, a tough area. Whereas I, to some extent, decided to um, do what I was told. I, I did what I was told. I can't, you might not believe this as a kid, and which was to work hard. Uh, as science first, and that's paid off for me. But uh, yeah, um, uh, to some extent, uh, because I've got all this, I wasn't able to help my kids as, as much as I perhaps should, um, uh, because I didn't think, I always thought everybody, that my kids would be like me. Thank you so much, Professor Croto, for your time here with us, and we wish you all the best in all your future endeavors, and hope to see you again in Vietnam soon. Okay, well, the, most likely on the internet. Okay, <laughs> thank, thank you very you. much. It's been a pleasure. And that's it for today's edition of Talk Vietnam. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did and found the inspiration from what Professor Croto, Chemistry Nobel Laureate from 1996, has told us. Thank you, and see you again next time.